Hello friends. I would like to share with you, my comprehension about current events, and how they are related to the narcissist satanic agenda. Before I start, I want to give a big shout out to friends, sponsoring this channel. This channel exists, not for advertisements purpose, or product placement, but to share useful information for people recovering from narcissist, and SR abuse. Jesus Christ, has brought me from coma, and many life-threatening situations. I understand that Jesus has given me a messenger task, which I try to fulfill in a humble way. All the glory belongs to God. I am just a man, who is being saved by grace, and has woken up to the truth. Therefore, the name of this channel. And await man, or wakeman. For friends following this channel, you've heard me saying to get ready for trying times ahead. I am not a prophet or a use divination. I just share what the Holy Spirit puts in my heart to understand and share with you. Well folks, about the mention trying times, we are here. I am not making this video to bring fear, but to bring you courage and love. Everything happening nowadays has been prophesied in the Bible, and through the Bible is where I get the confirmation received by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, everything happening nowadays is according to God's will to bring the truth about narcissists and bring them to his justice. Today I bring you this message to emphasize the good news and not the catastrophic events unfolding at faster and greater pace. I feel there is a renewal about to take place, however, a cleansing is necessary before it happens. Just like we need to cleanse ourselves from the effects of the abuse before we experience recovery and freedom from it. I feel that before the harvest, the tear, is being gathered. This is the reason so many horrible events are being carried out by satanic narcissists. Remember that Satan is the first narcissist currently ruling this world with his minions. Narcissists have been terrified with the Great Awakening, and this is the reason they want to bring about their depopulation agenda, and their totalitarian hive mind mentality. In the end, even Satan, the first narcissist, knows that Jesus Christ has already won this battle, but narcissists need to create intense fear to hinder people's capacity to see through the veils of his deceptions. Just as I realized I could not get deliverance from the abuse by my own works, the same applies to get ready for the harvest after the tear is separated and burned. We need the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to get saved and delivered. Remember, the narcissist establishment wants you to be overwhelmed by fear and with a sense of abandonment. The establishment will bring destruction to prevent people from realizing the truth of God. This is all by design, to get you away from the love of the truth, and the good news, the renewal of all things by God. I pray you do not fall for it, but be ready to make important and life-saving decisions. The revival has just begun, and I want you to get ready for it. God bless you. Please, remember. Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. Lord, give us your word now and speak clearly to our hearts. Lord, we need you. You need to hear from heaven, and we're trusting you now in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter, fourth chapter. First Peter, the fourth chapter. Getting ready for the end of all things. First Peter, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read just a few verses. Uh, start in verse 7, please. First Peter 4, beginning of verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Now, that's pretty blunt. He gets up before his people, or and in his letter he writes, the end has come. He said, and be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Thank you, Jesus. Now, uh, in Second Peter 1.14, he has just announced, the Lord has shown me that I'm going to die. The Lord has shown me that my time has come. And so he comes to the people now as a dying man. 
He comes as if to say, I'm soon going to be with my heavenly father. I'm soon going to be with Christ. So I'm going to give you my final word. He said, I want you to know the end of all things is at hand. It's right at hand. You say, well, that was written 2,000 years or so ago. But folks, if, if it were true then, it's all the more true now. At the end of the very last of the last days. And he said, I'm going to tell you what God expects and what he wants of you. I'm going to tell you how to become secure. I'm going to tell you how to prepare for the end times. And you see, he says nothing about the economy. He says nothing about the loss of houses and lands. He says nothing about uh, where to put your money, nothing about safe havens. And he comes with this, and, and uh, I, I got a letter from somebody, uh, read one of my prophetic books about how God's going to keep his people in the coming depression. And he said, I wrote to you, <clears throat> Pastor Dave, in good faith, and I believe that you're an honest, righteous man, and I ask you where I should put my money, uh, some safe place to put my money, because he said, really, if God's warning us, he wouldn't be a very good God if he didn't tell us how to survive. And he was trying to put me on the spot, and he said, I, I want to know. I don't want any theological uh, cop-out. He said, that's what you preachers do. You cop out and just say, go pray, because that's what I told him. Pray and get the mind of the Holy Ghost for yourself. And he, he said, I feel cheated. He said, I, I wanted to hear, certainly God would have a word. He would not warn us unless he gave us a way to survive. And I get letters like that. And already since I mentioned my topic, how to prepare for the end of all things, uh, some of you feel like, well, uh, Brother Dave, this, as soon as I announce this subject, well, Pastor Dave is going to give us some good advice on uh, where to put our money and help us get fixed for the hard times that have already started. And that, that's a good, honest question. We all ask those questions. But folks, uh, this is not going to make sense to you until we get to the last half of the message. And you'll see why Peter goes with this message. As he, he says, first of all, be sober. In other words, don't panic. That's his first advice. No matter what happens. And there's many Christians right now who are in panic. Who have, who have believed and testified all their lifetime that the Lord was their keeper. We sing Jehovah Jireh. We sing all these wonderful songs about how good God is and how he's going to keep us in the hard times. And it, There is a human nature in us that responds, and we, we have to bring it under the word. We have to bring it under the control of faith. But he's saying, be sober, first of all. Be sober. And then second, he says, go to prayer. He said, you, you wonder why you're confused, you wonder why you're in turmoil, you wonder why you're in panic, and you're not sober in these times. And he's saying the worse it gets, the blacker the night, the more you're, you should be walking in soberness and the peace and the rest of the Holy Ghost. That's what he says, as hard as that sounds, that is, that's what I'm telling you God told me before he takes me home. I'm telling the church of Jesus Christ in my day and in the days to come, there are going to be hard and difficult times. And Peter describes those times. Mockers and scoffers are going to come. There are going to be those preaching deception in our churches. There are going to be preachers of covetousness and materialism. He goes on to describe all of those things that are coming. And he says, don't panic. Be at peace about it. And then he says, go to prayer. And folks, that, there, that's where I go. Every time fear tries to rise in my spirit, every time there's another news report that seems to just uh, uh, be overwhelming, I go to the Lord. I go to my knees. And that's the answer to all the stress problems. I just saw in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that all over Wall Street now, they have a whole hour and, and many of the corporate leaders are, are into yoga and in, into Chinese mantras. And they're trying to calm their stress. 
And it, in some offices now, it's mandatory that you go and take yoga so that you can uh, calm yourself. Well, folks, we have a Savior. We have a promise. And we are going to be a testimony that we know how to handle stress. We've got a little room we go into. It's called the secret closet. <laughs> Tell that to the world. Here, here's a world, here's a world uh, looking at crystals, hoping beams will come out of those crystals. And, and there are people doing yoga and quoting uh, Chinese mantras that they don't know what it means. Um, <laughs> then, then you tell them you've got a secret closet where you go and you come out strong and they're going to say, you're crazy. You're stupid. What do you mean a secret closet? Well, what do you know about yoga? I've, I've got somebody that takes all my stress away. <laughs> King of Kings. I meet him right in that little... You mean you meet God? Yes. We meet God in the secret closet of prayer. And then he, he goes on. He, he said in verse 8, And above all things, above all things, above all preparations, above everything you think about how to survive in the end times, he said, I'm going to give you word, and this, this is the issue. And you have to deal with this. And, and this is mind-boggling at first. He, he, he says, above all things, have fervent, on fire, mercy and love for your brothers and sisters. He said, what are you saying? You're not, if you want to really know what survival is about, if you know where God is taking his people, you have to have this unconditional love for your brothers and sisters where race has no uh, there's there's no barrier in race no until this church has over a hundred nationalities of all colors and all nations and I, I want you to know this church is under attack for that very reason many times it would not be under attack if it were just all white or all black or all hispanic there are churches like that, and thank God for them. But this is a special thing that God is doing here in New York City and has done a hundred or more nationalities loving one another without racial prejudice. And, and this is what the apostle says, Peter says, this is the issue now, that there is a love. There's a, out, out in the front, it says, uh, Times Square Church, the church that love is building. It doesn't say the church that loves its building. It says the church that love is building. Hallelujah. He, he, he says, the reason for this is because this kind of love covers a multitude of sins. It covers a multitude of sins. Now, here's the issue. And I want you to listen very, very closely. Paul said, if you want to be ready for what God is going to do, because I'm going to show in just a minute that in the end times, and I've already told you, I gave away my secret before I started the breach. There's coming a latter rain of the Holy Spirit. And we're, going to, we're going to go into that. And th this, is where Paul, this is where Peter's going. This is where he's going with this message. What he's saying, what God's about to do cannot happen. It will be hindered unless these things are dealt with in the body of Jesus Christ. Anything of prejudice... Any member of the body of Christ. Now, we can't forgive the, those who sin against God. We can't forgive those sins. We can't cover those sins. But, but he said, I can't move. The Holy Spirit is, 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 is going to come in a great rain upon this earth. He said, it can't happen in a church. It can't happen among a people where there are those that are holding grudges, when there are those who say they love one another, but they can come and they can worship, they, can, they, they, they say I'm a part of the body of Jesus Christ here, and, and yet they come week after week, week after week, and they have not forgiven, they've not forgiven somebody who hurt or wounded them. They've not, hurt, they've, they've not resolved this issue. It just stays there day after day and week after week. 
And, and the Bible says we're not only to forgive, but we're to cover the sins of those who've sinned against us. Now, it may have been a wife or husband, a divorce situation. It could have been a, a church uh, a whole group that wounded you and hurt you. It could be an individual or a group of individuals. It could be a husband, a wife. It could be family. And there are those sitting in this church now, and I say it with love and, and compassion. I'm telling you, this will hinder what God is going to do in the church. It's going to hinder what he wants to do in your life and in your home. This has to be dealt with. Is there anyone that you, you have a difficult time forgiving? You say, well, I've forgiven, but I can't forget. Well, then you haven't forgiven. The Bible says, and, and this love that God expects of us is so vast and so all-encompassing. He, he said, now, you not only forgive but you do everything you can to cover their sin. Don't broadcast. And this is what happens. Somebody grieves us, someone wounds us, someone rejects us, and we tell it everywhere. We get on the phone. I just have to get this off my heart. You'll never know what they did to me, and we name names, and we, we name places, and we go, we go down deep into this pit, and then we say, I, I'm only telling you this so you can pray with me. I'm only telling you this because I'm concerned about them and they may lose the touch of God for what they did to me. You should be more concerned about whether you lose the touch of God <laughs> because you didn't cover the sin. I can cover anyone who sins against me. I have that authority. I have, in fact, I'm commanded to do just that and that's what the Apostle Peter is saying. This love, you want to be ready for all things, you'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. You want to be ready when the bottom drops out of everything? You want to be ready? Make sure that you have nothing hindering the flow of the Holy Spirit. There's something wonderful coming. I don't want to be left out. If you have wounded me, and I don't know about it, if you talked about my, me behind my back, and, and you wounded me, I, I, I'm glad I don't know, but I forgive you. I don't... I don't I can't name a grudge I have against anybody because I know what happens. I know I lose the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and I know that, that I, have, uh, I have roadblocks. I've got stumbling block in my life. You should be able to sit in this church today and, and, and go over in your memory of, of that thing that is in your heart. And some of you are visiting here. God's speaking to you too. Who is it? Who is it that you have such a hard time getting that out of your system? You, I just can't. I talked to a pastor recently. A group of ministers really hurt him. And, uh, and I was aware of the situation, hurt him deeply. And I, I talked to him. He said, you know, Brother Dave, I, I've been preaching for years, but I just can't forgive them. I can't do it. And he said, my wife will never forgive. And she was in deep bitterness. This, this, he, he said, you want to be ready? There's a context here in which, a wide context that uh, Peter's talking about. He, he's seeing something coming and he wants the church to be ready. Now, if, if all, all you want is for God to give you food and shelter, now, as a father, I want that for my children and grandchildren, and, and, and I want him to provide all my physical needs. He's promised to do that. You see, Peter didn't go there. He didn't go there about advice on, on physical preparations. He didn't go there because, you see, he knew poverty. He knew what it's like to not have a, a cent, a shekel, in his pocket because the only money he had at times was came out of a fish's mouth. This man had one change of clothes. He had one pair of sandals. This, this man had proven God's faithfulness, so that wasn't an issue with him. That, that, he can't even imagine Christians not believing that the Lord would provide. I've been down that way. He said, this is the preparation I want you to talk about. I, I want you to focus on. There's an issue here. I, I want 
you to look into your heart. And I, 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 you're to love even your enemies, the scripture says. You know, Jesus didn't give advice on how to repair physically other than in Jerusalem. He said, when you see the armies coming, flee from Jerusalem. You don't find him that. He, he says, don't give any thought about tomorrow because it's going to take care of itself. And I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what, how you're going to be clothed. Don't give it any thought. You won't find Jesus going there. You won't find Peter going there. You don't, the apostle Paul doesn't go there. They had proven God. And you have proven God already. You have proven God faithful up to this hour. He's never failed you yet. He's brought you out of every situation. He's taken care of you financially. You are not in poverty. You have a roof over your head. You have food on your table. And he's going to see you through. All right, I want to go. into this matter of the spirit coming down. And this is, this, this is the context in which Peter is speaking now. He said, there's a great rain coming. You'll find that uh, all through the New Testament, you find it in the prophets especially. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament that there's coming, there's been a former rain and there's a latter rain. The Bible talks about two rains. And, and Moses told Israel, he, he said, there can be no harvest unless there's a latter rain. The first rain, the early rain, came in the spring. And it watered the seed and the blade and the grass or, or, or the forming of it. But he said that it comes uh, before the harvest, before the full grain of corn, there has to be another rain. It's called the latter rain. Now, years ago, there was a... Uh, uh, Pentecostal movement called themselves the latter rain. Now, some say they got in. I don't know all the circumstances or the, <clears throat> the history of that movement. And they said it went into error. But they, they, they had a truth. They had something from the heart of God. And I believe he's going to restore this truth to the church of Jesus Christ. Moses said there's an early rain, but there can be no harvest until there's a latter rain. Here's, here's the scripture. He will give you the rain in your land in due season, the first and the latter rain, so you may gather in the corn, the wine, and the oil. He said, you'll have, you're going to have a rain that uh, ripens the harvest. And beloved, the early rain came at Pentecost in the upper room. That was the rain that watered the seed of the word, that, that watered the message of Jesus Christ, and it began to grow and spread. But now, folks, in the last days, when the world is trembling and gross darkness covers the world, there is no way Jesus would come without. Now, he can come at any moment, but he promises there will be a latter rain. And he says, ask Rain in the time of the latter rain. We're to ask rain, the prophet said. You're to believe God and ask him and believe that this latter rain is promised in the scripture and that it's to come. The prophet Zechariah saw the outpouring of the spirit in the last days. He said, ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain and the Lord shall make bright clouds and he will give you showers of rain and everyone shall have grass in their field. Everyone shall have grass. There's going to be a harvest. He said, the field is going to be ripe. Jesus said, they're white unto harvest. Now, Satan knows this. He knows what is written in the scripture. He knows that there's a tremendous, incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the harvest. And he's going to come against the church of Jesus Christ, knowing what is coming, he saw what happened in the early rain. He saw the, the growth of the church around the world, every kindred and every tongue and every nation. And uh, he saw the power of the Holy Spirit. He saw what happens when the Holy Spirit comes down. And so the latter rain, Satan knows what is about to happen. Folks, 
there, there's, there's no way that the Lord is going to take his church out of this world limping and broken and fearful and just broken in spirit and mind and soul. No, 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 no. He's not coming and allow Islam to take over the harvest. He's not going to let anybody. The harvest is his. The harvest, the Bible said, is the end of the world. And we've come to the end of things. We've come the beginning of the end. Now, I don't know how many years. I don't, I'm not going to go to the prophet, prophetic times. I don't know that much about what happens after Jesus comes. I've, I've not been a scholar in that at all. But I know from what I'm reading in the scriptures, and the more I read, the more my faith rises. There is a coming outpouring of the Holy Spirit beyond Pentecost, beyond what happened in the upper room. But you see, Peter knew what had to happen. In early day Pentecost, they had what they call waiting on the Lord. They, in the upper room, they waited on the Lord. Now, they weren't waiting just for a calendar date. Pentecost was fully come. But God was doing something. He's doing just what Peter's talking about. There had to be forgiveness. Peter had to be forgiven because he wounded the body of Christ. He wounded every one of them. And, and there had to be an outflow of love in that upper room. And God's dealing with things. Peter could not stand up there and be anointed of the Holy Ghost. He can't stand there if people later, some of the apostles, uh, and there's James and John who, who had boasted they were better than the other disciples and had this pride. And they're sitting there. They have to be cleansed. They have to be forgiven by the body of Jesus Christ. And their sins have to be covered. They have to be able, those men have to be able to look at Peter later when the Holy Spirit gives him the authority and he preaches what the Pentecost is all about. And there can't be something in their heart was, who made you the leader? Who made you the pastor? Who made you, who gave you this special anointing? No, they sat back. They didn't care who got the honor. They knew the Holy Ghost was there and they were covering. Nobody dare speak against Peter because Peter is safe now in the house of God. He's among people who don't blab what Peter did. Nobody's talking about it in this upper room. They're talking about the Holy Ghost and they're getting free because they're loving, they're forgiving, and they're covering. Do you understand where Peter's going? He said there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and he comes only to those who are prepared. They were prepared in the upper room. Oh, folks, I still believe on waiting on the Lord. Yes, the Holy Ghost was given, but there's something about waiting in the presence of the Lord where he's allowed to deal with these issues in our heart. And so we can have this forgiveness and we, we, we can have the strength and power. It takes power to forgive. It takes even more power and grace to cover somebody's sin after they've wounded or rejected or hurt you. And God wants to pour out his spirit in this church as we have never known or seen. He, he wants to save multitudes. And he's going to do that. But first, he's coming to purge his body. He's coming to cleanse. And he's not doing it with a rod or a whip in his hand. He's doing it through brokenness and a humble word, a, a compassionate call. Don't let anything hinder the glory of the Lord that's coming. Don't let anything hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit in your family. Don't let anything, don't, don't be a hindrance to the work of God and what he wants to do. Oh, if, if you belong, if, if you worship here at Times Square Church and you feel this is your church home, God help us all, help me, help every pastor, help everyone in the choir and orchestra and everybody in this body to be able to walk through these doors and sit here and raise your hands and worship him and you know there's nothing there between you and the Lord. There's no hindrance that your heart is open. And if, you, if you've been sinning, if you failed God, you come to the blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, the blood has never lost its power. And I have to believe that he will give us through the power of his blood. It, the cross is not in vain. It's not been in vain. 
If there is not an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days, why was there an early Pentecost? Why was there an early rain? Look at all these, all of these many years since the first outpouring, the early rain. Do you mean to tell me that the Lord, when we need the Holy Ghost the most, when we need the Holy Ghost to survive daily, when we need the power of the Holy Ghost to be his witness, when, when everything is shaking and the darkness is here, we have got to have an anchor. We, the Holy Spirit comes to reveal Christ. He comes to dig deep into our spirits to make us vessels made worthy through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And what Zechariah is saying is, wake up, church, the Holy Spirit and the glory is going to fall upon nations. So many people feel helpless. But folks, this, this can't be worked up. This is a prophetic word, and you have to allow and ask the Holy Spirit to increase your faith, to believe and stand on his word. Haggai stands before a discouraged people. They're, they're remembering the glory of the old temple. The old tabernacle is gone. And now God is doing a new work. And they're, they're building a temple now that seems so insignificant to what God did in the past. And, and they're standing, they're weeping. And the prophet Haggai, I, I think is in the chapter, he says, uh, I see you looking at what God is doing here now. He said, some of you lived then, who was 60 to 70 years apart, and some of them are still living. And when they were young, they saw the glory of that first work of God. What a great work God did back then. You hear that a lot about the revivals of the past, what God did back then. And all the glory we had and all the wonderful meetings we had and people got saved and we tarried half the night and, and that's wonderful. Thank God. Thank God. I have those wonderful memories hidden in my heart. And the prophet looked at these people downcast and, and looking at that and, and, and he, he says, who's left among you that saw the house in its first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as if it's nothing? Do you understand what this is saying? Some of us who walk with God for years, we remember the movings of the Holy Spirit, remember the great things God did. But the prophet Haggai says, now, look at, now, you're discouraged and you, you, you think that this is nothing and that, that we are you're, we're just waning in zeal. The, there's no glory left. And, and we've, we've been overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the darkness. We've been so overwhelmed with what is happening. We get overwhelmed at the fury of the devil. We get overwhelmed of the homosexual uh, militancy and, and, and our courts making laws that we don't agree with and never asked for, never voted for. And we, we get overwhelmed with the fury of Satan among us. We get overwhelmed with the darkness, overwhelmed with the thought we've sinned away our day of grace, overwhelmed with fears and doubts. And that's what happened. They're saying, in their minds, they're saying, well, this is nothing. We have nothing to rejoice about. God's not doing anything. This is so insignificant. Oh, Haggai says, fear not. And God said this in Haggai 2, 5. My spirit remains among you. My spirit is still at work. And then he turns to the people and says, I'm telling you, the glory of this house is going to be greater than the first house. The rain that's coming is greater than the early rain. There's a latter rain. So take away that frown. Lift up holy hands because the rain is coming and God's spirit is moving. And I'm not going to let the devil let me be downcast. 
I don't want my eyes on, on what God is doing to say it's so insignificant. America has not sinned away its day of grace. The world has not sinned away its day of grace. The revival is just begun. The rain is beginning to fall. Hallelujah. I got so excited last night because I was reading in the book of Revelation. He said, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn of the ear. See, everything's ripening now. And the scripture says in Revelation 14, 15, thrust in the sickle. And begin to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then I, I went on and I read this in Revelation 14, 14, the verse prior to what I've just read to you. And I, I got so excited. I, I went into the bedroom. Gwen was retiring. I'd been in my study last night. And I said, Gwen, I'm, I am shouting inside. And I walked back and forth in our apartment down the street. Behold, he comes in a cloud, a crown on his head, and a sickle in his hand. What's a sickle? It's that long harvesting thing, got a big sharp blade on it where you just mow down the harvest. And the Bible says of our Christ, hallelujah. He's not there just hoping the saints will hold on. He's not there surprised at the darkness. Behold, he comes in a white cloud. Say it with me, a crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. That makes me want to jump. A crown on his head. Say it, a crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. Folks, it's harvest time. On Wall Street, in the Bowery, uptown, downtown, New Jersey, and all over this nation and around the world. Glory to God. It's harvest time. It's beginning to rain. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Yes. Will you stand? Do you see what Peter's saying now, folks? Remove everything that hinders because the glory is coming. Like you've never seen or know or experienced the glory of the Lord. And you know what that glory is? The manifest presence of Jesus Christ. We will know his presence as we've never known it. We will know him as we've never known him. And people are going to be open to the gospel. He's going to melt hard hearts and many others he's going to bring through calamity where they have no place to turn but to God. And we will be ready with a message of hope and not despair. Now, in prayer, I asked the Holy Spirit how I was to close this service. And it's simply this. The Holy Spirit made known to me, I don't know how many, but in the overflow balcony here in the main auditorium, there's some of you here that have a hindrance. This thing has become, uh, has a stranglehold on you. It's a root of bitterness, a root. And that root has to come out. And it's dug in and you, you don't want it anymore. You want to be free of this. You've carried it long enough. And I believe God hears when we pray, if we agree together, two or three agree together concerning anything on earth, it shall be done to the Father in heaven. And I want to pray with you. 
I want God to remove that hindrance, but you have to want it. You have to humble yourself. That's right. Humble yourself. You're not caring what anybody says or think. And there has to be something rise up here that says, I want to walk out of this church today free. I want to walk out of this church without this chain on me, without this burden. You, you have felt and seen the agony. And if you don't forgive, it's going to come around. And whatever you did comes back in like manner in another way. And you face it again and again. Face it now. And let the Holy Spirit bring you to a place of victory. And free you. And you'll know a freedom and a joy like you haven't experienced in a long time. Uh, Greg ministered to us for a moment in song. And I want you to just step out. If you don't know Christ, you can come now. And he'll come and reveal himself to your heart and change your life. If you've been drifting away from Christ, if you're backslidden in your heart, follow these that are coming. And the balcony... Up there, just go down the stairs on either side and come down these aisles and main and come. Just humble yourself and say, Pastor Dave, I want you to pray for me. I want freedom. I don't want to carry this burden any longer. I know that takes a lot of grace, but it's that important. It's life and death. That's it. Just follow these that are coming. Help me to know that you are near. Do you know that he's near you right now? Do you know he said, my spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit hasn't left you. The Holy Spirit brought you down to the aisle to the front of this church for prayer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You begin there thanking the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me and dealing with my heart. And look this way for just a minute. You took a humble step, boldly to step out and acknowledge your need. Now, you're among friends. You're safe in this house. Nobody's wondering what your problem is or who you have a struggle with. Nobody's thinking that. They're just anxious for you to come through to victory, come through to peace with God. Will you pray this prayer with me before I pray with you, Lord Jesus? I do humble myself and I come to you for forgiveness. Lord, I have a problem. I have this root in me. I'm asking you to pluck it out. I'm asking you to forgive me and help me to forgive and cover the sins of all those who have hurt me. Lord Jesus, I want to be free. I want to be free right now. So I cast this in your feet. I give it to you. Cleanse me. In Jesus' name, I receive healing of every hurt and every root to be plucked out. Now let me pray for you. Lord, I know you hear when we pray. I know you hear when we cry out to you in our need. And I pray, Lord, that you do that by your spirit right now. Just move in and among us. He said, I'm among you. I, I, I am with you. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And Lord, we come fearlessly now. We come boldly to the throne of grace. We ask you, Lord, to help us to face this and say, I don't want it anymore. I don't want anything unlike Christ in me. I want to be free. I want the glory of Christ in my life. I want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I need a new baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I need this from you now, Jesus. We need to hear from you. Cleanse and sanctify. Change us, God, by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, you have come down and you are breathing on this church and you're breathing throughout the land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, just raise a hand or both hands to the Lord. And say, I believe. I believe, Lord, right from your heart. I believe you, Lord, for cleansing and healing. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Nothing between. Hallelujah. 
Now, you can be free right now if you receive by faith the word of the Lord. You can be free. <laughs> Beloved, we are, with this I close, we are delivered, we're set free by the word of the Lord. Yes. Accepted and believed by faith. If this is your church, and if if this not, if you're visiting from another country, if you're visiting from another church, uh, just go to your pastor and say, Pastor, I believe a rain's coming. I, I believe there's a great harvest, and I want to be one of the first to start praying and believing in that direction. Spread the word. Hallelujah. Folks, God's about to shut down every so-called revival that features the flesh. It's all coming down. They're not going to be able to afford it anymore. The, the money's going to dry up. And it's going to be genuine. You're not going to have any stars. You're not going to feature any preachers or evangelists. It's going to be ordinary people, just like you. Just like me, just be ordinary people. And it's going to be people and pastors that step out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> Would you turn to two or three people and say, it's going to rain? It's going to rain. I want you to believe that. Father, I thank you, God, with all of my heart for your presence. As Moses once said, Lord, if you don't go with us, there's no point in going forward. But God, thank you that you have chosen for almost 33 years now to walk with this church. You've kept us, my God. You've journeyed with us. Your presence has always been here in the sanctuary. Even when we're not here, there's a lingering presence of the Holy Spirit here. Thank you for your grace, your goodness. You brought us through flood, fire, trial, every difficulty, Lord God, you have been so faithful. Thank you, Lord, that you choose us, not because we're wise, not because we're skilled, but God, as your word declares, you choose the weak and the foolish things of this world to confound those things that stand in their own strength and their own wisdom. One more time today, speak to our hearts. One more time, Lord, take this frail vessel and pour your life-giving word through it. I pray, God, for the grace to hide behind the cross, to literally disappear, that you may appear before your people. Speak to every heart, every situation, Lord. <clears throat> My voice can only say one thing at one time, but there's no limits to your voice. You can go into every need, every heart, every situation that's here today and online, and God, you can meet and answer those questions. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Now, if you'll find the book of Ezra, if you have your Bible with you, or if you have a, uh, any kind of device that has the Word of God on it, the book of Ezra, and I'm going to be using the New King James Version this morning, if you're looking for um, one that has the same words that I'll be using. And I have a word that God's put on my heart, and here's, here's what it's entitled. God is with us, let's rise and build. God is with us, let's rise and build and build. Praise God. Instead of trying to pretend you know where the book of Ezra is, just go to the index, please, in your Bible. <laughs> and it'll give you a page number. It makes it a lot easier to find. <laughs> oh, pride is a terrible thing, isn't it? <laughs> Ezra chapter 1. It's between Second Chronicles and Nehemiah, if that helps somebody here today. Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now who stirred him up? He's a Medo-Persian king. He's not a partaker of the Jews' religion. He can appreciate it even though he's not a partaker of it. But the Lord stirred up the spirit of of this world leader at this time, Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, 
saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Midrathath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Shezbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Well, let, me, let me just set the scene for this particular moment in history. People of God had been called of God to be a blessing in the earth. They had been called to a specific place on the earth, the nation we now call Israel, to a particular city, Jerusalem. In this place, the glory of God dwelt in the temple. We know these things from history, from the witness of the text of Scripture. The people of God were to be a special people, empowered by God, gifted by God, touched by God, changed by God, given giftings and abilities that only God could give them, and they were to be a praise and a testimony to him and the earth. Now that's similar to the, actually it's exactly the same as the calling that is on your life and on mine as part of the church of Jesus Christ in our generation. But the people of that time dealt very casually with their calling. They didn't really take it seriously. And they began to do other things and the service or worship of God began to be a, maybe a matter of convenience. And their, their worship and the temple attendance began to take on forms that God never intended it to. And the purpose that God had ordained for them as the people of God, like sand, just slipped through their fingers into the ground. And suddenly they found themselves powerless as an enemy surrounded them called Babylon took captive in three stages the people of God and brought them into a foreign land for 70 years. 70 years they were in captivity. 70 years they were in a place they ought not to have been. It can happen. It happens throughout history. It happens to churches. It happens to believers. It happens to families. It happens. We end up in a place that we're not destined to be there. That was not God's plan. It wasn't God's purpose for us to be there. It was a time of chastening. It was a time of maybe reconsidering uh, what their calling was supposed to have been, at least in the earth. And then suddenly, revival comes. Revival. Now let me define revival. Revival, first of all, is God's initiative. It's something that God determines in his heart to do. He'd already predetermined that he would let the enemies of God's people captivate them for 70 years, and he'd already spoken through the mouth of Daniel the prophet, at the time when they were taken into captivity, that at the end of 70 years, God would visit them and bring them home. There are promises in the word of God, my brother, my sister. I say it's time to get into the word of God. It's time to know the promises of God because there are promises in this book that deal specifically for you, for me, even for this time that we're now living in. And you and I have to know these promises. We've got to know what the word of God says. 
Revival is God saying, the enemy has had my people in his grip long enough. I'm going to bring them home. And he stirs the heart of a king who's not a believer as they were. Not a, he's, he's of another nation, Medo-Persia, but God stirs him. God stirs his heart. As a matter of fact, God named him before he was born. In the book of Isaiah said, I'm going to, my servant Cyrus is going to, he called him by name long before Cyrus was even born, let alone ended up ruling a good part of the world of his time. And God stirred his heart to let the people go home and to let them rebuild the testimony that had fallen through their fingers in their generation. Now, revival usually happens in response to a cry among some, at least, of God's people. Maybe not all. Some probably were quite content. Maybe they'd gotten themselves a fairly good life in Babylon. They're living in mixture. Uh, they've, they've lost their purpose, and maybe some don't care. But there's always that voice. There's always that person. Maybe it's not a public figure, can be a person like you or me who's just, just in your own house, your own apartment, and you're just, you're sighing in your heart and saying, God, it's not right the way things are today. It's not right the way your, your people are being treated. It's not, it's not right that you're not known, Jesus. You're not revered. You're not loved. Your, your word is being cast into the streets as if it's something evil. It's, it's simply not right. The prophet Habakkuk in chapter three, verse two, he's, he says, oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In your wrath, remember mercy. I don't know about you, but that cry has been in my heart since I was in my 20s. Oh God, oh God. When I think of what the nation could be if people's hearts opened again to who you are, why you went to a cross, what eternity can look like. You know, we sing that song this morning, meet me, everybody's gonna be happy over there. But people who don't come to Christ, I'll tell you, they're not gonna be happy for eternity. Hell is very real. It's a very, very real place. And I don't think our minds or vocabulary have enough words or anything close to describing the agony that's of eternity in a place where God is not. There's no way you and I can fully even comprehend that. Revival or spiritual awakening comes suddenly. It's unanticipated. It's unusual. And it begs a response. It comes when we don't expect it. And sometimes you look out throughout history and quite often spiritual awakening happens when the country seems to be at its worst. The behavior's at its worst. Think of the great revivals that have struck the nation of England. And if you look at the history, it's a time when people are, there's people drunk and fornicating in the streets all throughout the cities at the time. They, they say the moral, the moral temperature couldn't have gone any lower, but suddenly the spirit of God starts to move among the people. Praise be to God. So it's sudden, it's, it's not anticipated. You see, because it's not a work of man. It, it's not something that happens because a committee gets together and decides, look, we're going to rent a stadium, we're going to have a big event, and God's going to come. No, that's, that's human effort trying to procure revival, and, and, it, and I'm, I'm all for anything that people can do to glorify God. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But true spiritual awakening is God-initiated, not man-initiated. It's God-initiated. And it does not require a plan on our part. It requires a response. Ezra chapter 1 in verse three, well, first of all, in verse one, it says, the Lord stirs the heart of a king. Can you imagine being there at that time? You're, you're captivated. You're, you're, your rulers are ungodly. You're, you're in a place where they've, they've gloated. Oh, you're the people of God, are you? What are you doing here? Have you ever heard that in your workplace or your neighborhood or whatever the situation is? And then suddenly word comes, the king has issued a decree that God, the God he doesn't serve, has ordered him to build a house in Jerusalem. In verse 3, he issues a decree in writing and says, Who is among you of all his people? In other words, who is for him? Who in this kingdom actually belongs to him? Who's part of his grand purpose in the earth? Who desires to live a life that brings glory to his name? Who, like David, the young king, when he came walking into the camp of Israel, when they faced the Philistines, who's concerned about the honor of God? 
Who wants their life to be what God has destined it to be? Who, who is left of the people of God? And don't forget it had been 70 years of this mixture and this captivity. Now Cyrus says, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So it begs a response. Spiritual awakening begs a response. A call, a cry goes out. The rebuilding is starting. God is on the move again. God is going to do for his people and through his people what only God can do. So who belongs to him and who is concerned that he's asking us to recapture, regain what was lost through neglect and negligence? And verse 4 says, And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold and goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And so Cyrus is saying, if there are people here who can't go for whatever reason, maybe you just don't have the strength for the journey, maybe you're too old, maybe whatever the situation is, but everybody should do something. That's what, this is coming from Cyrus, a Medo-Persian king. There's, people should get up and go to rebuild, and everybody who's part of the family of God should help them in whatever way they can. Those that are going, whatever, everybody needs to do something in this rebuilding of the testimony of the glory of God in the earth. And then it goes even deeper than this. This is the phenomenal thing. It says, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put them in the temple of his gods. In other words, everything that God had given the pattern to King David, who had given it to his son Solomon, who had fashioned all of these instruments that were necessary for the sacrifices that would go on in the temple, instruments that were necessary in the worship of God, in the cleansing of God's people, all the things that were part of the religion of that time. Now the people would assume that they'd all been lost. And the devil would love to have them believe so, and they can never be regained. But contrary to that, you see, nothing of God is ever lost. It's in storage. It's, it's, the numbers of them are counted. There are 5,400 instruments necessary in the worship of God in the temple. And all of these, can you imagine being among the people as, as all of these things are, are brought out of storage as it is? The, 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 the Babylonians who have now been conquered by the Medo-Persians, either one of those kingdoms could have melted them down, made gold bars out of them. They were made of gold, folks. They could have made currency out of it, but they, God is always in charge of everything. You say to me, where, where is the word of knowledge? It's in storage. Where are the gifts of healing? They're in storage. Where are the prophets? They're in storage. You see, nothing is lost. Nothing can be lost to the kingdom of God. And there are times and seasons throughout history where God says, bring out everything that was taken captive and give it back to the people of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory, 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 glory to the name of Jesus. Where is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's been in storage for a little while in some people's cases. Everything is coming out. Everything God makes available to his people once again. And says, who wants to rebuild? Who wants to go home? Who wants to glorify God in the earth? Who wants to see captivity taken captive one more time in this generation? Glory to God. I can just imagine being there in my heart. A psalmist wrote about it in Psalm 126. He said, when the Lord turned back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. We thought it was lost forever. We thought this dominant society, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, that was conquering the whole world with its new philosophies and new ways of doing things and thinking, considered themselves superior to the ways of God. We thought that our way of life was gone. It would never return to us. And then suddenly the gates open. Suddenly we realize the hand of God is moving again. And our captivity has indeed been taken captive. We were like those who dream. It was a dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. 
And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The psalmist says, the Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing his seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. In other words, our confidence in God, no matter where we are, no matter what kind of sorrow has hit our hearts, no matter how poverty-stricken we may feel to do anything about the hour we're now living in, if we have that cry in our heart, even if it's a, a cry of tears and sorrow for the loss of our time, the psalmist says, you will come home and you will be rejoicing and you will bring a harvest in with you. You will not come alone, you'll bring a harvest. <laughs> Praise be to God. Now here's where it gets really interesting for me as I was reading this. In chapter two, verse one says, now these are the people of the province who came back from captivity, of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, every one to his own city. And then, so for the rest of uh, chapter two, you're gonna see all these different houses, all these different families. For example, in verse three, it says, the people of Parash, 2,172. Verse six, says 2,812. Verse 10, the people of Bani, 642. Verse 14, the people of Big Vi, 2,056. Verse 17, the people of Bezai, 323. The people of Jorah, 112. Verse 21, the people of Bethlehem, 123. This is what this speaks to me. Not everybody is going to get up and rebuild. But in every town, in every city, in every state, in every place, there will be somebody. There will be somebody who gets up. There'll be some little towns. Oh, if God, if, 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 if the United States of America were in this book of Ezra, if we could be part of this, I see it this way. Of the state of Florida, 7,644 got up to build. Of the state of New Jersey, 5,322 got up to build. And not just states, but little towns. Of these little towns, 600 got up, 400, 123. They rose up. Of all denominations, of, of all places, they were the people of God. They were the body of Christ. And they heard the decree of the king. They heard something in their spirit. God is with us. Let's rise up and build. And I tell you, in America today, whoever can hear, God is with us. Let's rise up and build. Of the Methodists, 6,000. Of the Baptists, 50,000. Of this group, of that group, of that town. And now, it comes down to you. Praise be to God. May it be written of this moment in history. Of the family of Conlon, 63 got up to build. Again, the testimony of God. Of the family of Pastor David Ham, 127. Of the family of Great Thomas, 156. May it be said of us, may it be said of us that we rose up to build in this generation. May it be said of us that we were able to, to really sing freedom in our spirit. No more shackles of Babylon, no more chains, no more duplicity, no more compromise, no more bondage, no more association with sin, no more wickedness before our eyes, no more crooked speech out of our mouths. We're rising up, we're going to build the testimony of God because God is with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In your family and in your house, in every one of these houses listed in the book of Ezra, somebody was the first one to speak. Somebody stood up in their house. Somebody said, I'm hearing something in my heart. I've heard it 
with my ears. I hear it in my spirit. God is calling us back to the place where we once were. God is calling us to a place where we worship him again in spirit and in truth. God is calling us all to a place where we as his people bring glory and honor to his name by becoming a people that only God could make us into, by doing things that only God could do through us, by carrying in our possession things that only God could give to us. Somebody, somebody, somebody stands up. You don't have to shout it in your dining room. You don't have to say it like I'm saying it to you right now, but somebody says, I believe God is calling us to rebuild the testimony of who he really is. And he's giving us back everything we need. We need the understanding of the cross. We need to understand what true worship is all about. It's not just about hitting the right tune and waving our hands in the air. It's about coming into the house of God, having been empowered by God that week to do something that glorifies his name and coming in and lifting our hands and saying, God, thank you for what you did in my life. And thank you, God, for what you're going to do through me in the future. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to be faithful to my family. Thank you, God. You're going to bring all of my, those I love out of captivity. That is worship in spirit and in truth. It's not just coming in and listening to songs. God's going to give us back the understanding of these things. A hunger for his word. An ability to pray and to believe that when we cry, he hears. If you have the time, you read Psalm 107. It talks about four different categories of people. People who are rebellious. People who are indifferent. People who are taken captive because of their own foolishness. People who thought that money would bring them satisfaction. And all of these people run into trouble. And the scripture says, then they cry. And the Lord hears them. And brings them out of their place of captivity. And brings them into the place they've always desired to be. When God has heard the cry. God has heard the cry in America of the single mother who doesn't know how she's going to keep her children living for God. God has heard the cry of the father who doesn't know how to be a father but longs in his heart to be. God has heard the cry of the person who's sick and tired of the mixture of going to clubs on Friday night and trying to go to church on Sunday morning. God has heard the cry of the young person who says, I don't understand what commitment is, but oh God, I want to know what it is and I want to walk in your way and in your truth. God has heard the cry of his people and he is with us, so we have to rise up and build now. That's the call of God that's on his church and on our lives. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18. Here's what Nehemiah did. He said, I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me, also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. And they set their hands to this good work. Now you say, who's going to listen to me in my house? I'm the least in my house. And you see, that's why God throughout history has taken people so that it gives us an example of what real spiritual authority looks like. Nehemiah is a butler. He's a butler to the king. Gets a report that his city is in reproach and his people are suffering. The burden of the Lord comes on him. He leaves with king's permission, goes into Jerusalem and so here comes the butler. Now in Jerusalem, there are architects, I have no doubt, and there are, there are leaders, there are military people, there are skilled uh, civic leaders. And suddenly this guy whose only claim to fame is he, he carried a trade to the king, shows up and he says, God's hand is on me. And the king has given me good words and told me this thing can be done. And the people said, let us rise up and build. You see, don't underestimate what God can do through you, even in your own home. Whether or not you're a person of high position or a person of low position, you've been successful or you've been a failure in your own sight. So I've heard something from God, and I believe that he's going to rebuild something of his testimony on this earth, and we are to be part of it. And the people said, let us rise up and build. 
and they set their hands to this good work. And so that's my altar call for you today. Who, who will be the voice in your house? In the people that you know, who is willing to say, the hand of God is with me. I've heard the call of God. I've heard the words of the king. God is giving us a chance once again to build a testimony that will bring glory to his name on the earth. Just as the people of Ezra's day had to consider this word, so do you have to consider it today too. Some, I, I suppose, said, nah, we've heard all this before. It amounts to nothing. Others might have said, well, just wait now. It's, don't you think it's odd that in the midst of this captivity that God has raised up a king, a leader, that whose heart is towards the work of God and the people of God? Don't you think maybe that, maybe that God's giving us a window to do something that only he can do? The Bible says the hearts of kings are in the hands of God. Doesn't mean the king has to be a believer. The hearts of kings are in the hand of God. If we have a window and we are wise, then we will rise up and begin to build. For the sake, Nehemiah told the people, he said, for the sake of your children, rise up and build. For the sake of your families, rise up and build. For the sake of the stranger, rise up and build. And watch what God will do. So Father, I thank you, God, that I have given your people your word. This is a perilous moment in history. It's a dark moment in our nation. Our children are captivated. The ones that aren't killed in the womb are being radicalized and confused, even in school. And we recognize the peril of the moment we now live in. Our country is divided. Our culture is divided. Statesmanship seems to be no longer in existence. I pray, God, with all my heart, because the baton has now come and is in the hands of your people. Give us the grace, Lord, not to miss this moment in history. Give us the grace, like Daniel, to open the window towards Jerusalem and not close it like many others would have done. Give us the grace, Lord, to believe that you are still the God of the impossible. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear that which you have commissioned us to do in our generation. We don't know how, but we will know when we get there. You will show us. But for now, I pray, God, with all my heart, that you raise up a voice in every house. A voice in every house. Every house. Calling the least likely to rise up and join us and build the testimony of God in the earth once again. We thank you for the knowledge that you are already speaking to people's hearts and we will not be bringing something new to them, but something that they already know. Thank you, Lord. May it be said of each of our houses, may the number in heaven be recorded of those of our house that rose up to build those of every church, those of every small town in America, those of every city, those in government, those in education, those in every facet and form of life, every student in every school, that those of us who knew you, we heard the call and we rose up and we began to build. We ask you, Lord God Almighty, for the third great spiritual awakening and perhaps the greatest of all that America has ever known. We ask you to fill every house of worship in every town and every city. We ask you to fill living rooms all over the place with worshipers of God. We ask, Lord, that our park benches become altars, even in New York City. We ask you, Lord, to push back the wave of darkness that would want to swallow the entire country and give us a moment of revival and refreshing that may, we may worship you again. We ask you, Lord, to bring our children out of captivity to false ideologies. We ask you, Lord, for courage for each of us, Lord, to take our place and do what we're called to do. 
Deliver us from the spirit of self-consumption and cowardice. And give us the courage to be the people of God. We ask you for ears to hear your voice. My God, help us to hear you. Help us, Lord, to turn off all the other voices and to hear above the whole noise of this generation your voice calling us over the waves. Give us the grace of Peter when you called him in the storm to step out of the boat and walk towards you. Help us, Lord God, help us. Father, I thank you with all my heart. In Jesus' name, praise God. Now, you know, some of you are, are here at this altar and you say, well, you know, where do I start? What do I do? Well, what you and I have to do is we go back to the pattern in the Bible where 120 people who are weak, they were just weak people like you and I. They, they had nothing really to offer. They had no power to stand against a, a society that was enraged actually against Christ. I mean, how could they stand against that? But they went into a place of prayer and they began to pray and they began just to talk to God from their hearts. And they waited until God gave them the strength they needed to do what they were called to do. And when God's Holy Spirit came and gave them that strength, they went out into the public and they began to declare the things that God was about to do. Now you see 3,000 at least people coming by them from the temple. And that's part of that religious system that was so enraged it had just crucified Christ. A religious system that says we will not have this man to reign over us. He's a fraud. And suddenly they're so gripped by the testimony of a people who are declaring what God's about to do through their weakness. The 3,000 that day bent their knee and then eventually the mighty army of Rome bent its knee as well to Christ. And so don't be taken aback by your own weakness. This is where we start. We just go into prayer and say, God, give me the power. Give me your words. Give me the grace. Give me the courage. Lead me. Lead me. And when you speak to my heart, help me to have the courage to say to others what you've been speaking to me. Help me not to hold it back or modify it or try to make it more palatable. Just to help me to say it. And when you do that, you begin to do these things. You watch what will happen. You watch the knees that will begin to bend before you. So, Father, I thank you personally, God, for the the mighty army that you have gathered here at, at this altar and as well at Summit in North Jersey and in the Bronx and online in homes and living rooms. God, you're gathering an army again in this generation, not an army of the strong, but of the weak, an army of people like us who know that we need you and without you, we don't go forward. But we're hearing you call us in our barrenness, in our weakness, in our trials and struggles. We're hearing you call us so that the testimony of your power might be rebuilt again in the earth in our time. And so God, help us. Help us, Lord. Lead us, guide us. We don't know what else to say. We're going to go back to the beginning and start there. Help us to love you with all our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. God, help us to just do the first things first. And you'll guide us, Lord. And you'll give weight into our lives and our voices. We believe this, Lord, with all of our heart. I pray for an anointing that can only come from heaven on every man, every woman that has responded at this altar. And those who have responded in their hearts, Lord, in this church and online as well. I pray for the anointing of God. Lord, as you gave me in my youth, Lord, when I had no ability to speak, I didn't even care about people, Lord, but your Holy Spirit came on me and changed everything. And so God Almighty, I pray for that, that spirit of prophecy to come upon the people. The people would see into the future. They would understand what you desire to do and begin to speak it without cowardice. God Almighty, bringing your name to glory again in our generation. Lord, give us words of knowledge again, Lord, for young people who just so desperately need to know that you are real, that you are alive. Give us the ability to see the, the troubles in their heart and speak directly to it. Give us the ability like Daniel had to untangle mysteries. Oh God, people's situations, Lord, who, who don't think anybody knows, but you know, Lord, and speak to situations in the workplace, marriages that are in trouble. Speak to people through us, Lord. God Almighty, give us the courage. Speak to us and give us the grace that we would let you speak through us. Help us, Lord, to begin to rebuild the testimony of who you are in our generation. 
My God, I pray for this baptism of strength to be given to every man, woman, every young person, Lord God. Let us not be the same from this day forward. Let us be your people, a people to be wondered at, a people that bring glory as lights in the heavens. You told us we're a city set on a hill. We can't be hidden. So my God, let it be the portion of your church and your people in this generation. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that through us, prison doors would open everywhere and people would be set free. Blinded eyes would see the way forward into eternity and life. I pray for wounded hearts everywhere to be healed. Captives to be released, oh God. Through your church, my God, through your church, I pray, Lord, that our words would give strength to the poor, that they may understand that there is a God who loves them and will provide for them. God, thank you, Lord. God, thank you. Help us to be your church. Help us, Lord God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.